to British Murders, a true crime podcast with a focus on British murder cases. My name's Stuart Blues, and I'm excited for you to join me on this journey of morbid discovery. I'm by no means an expert on the subjects of homicide and serial killers. However, I have always had a sick fascination with them. Together, we will learn about some of the lesser known British murderers, as well as glimpsing occasionally at some of the more notorious ones. The bite-sized presentation of this podcast is intentional, as we look to cover an overview of the respective timelines of each case succinctly. The last woman to be hanged in public was Frances Kidder in 1868 after she drowned her stepdaughter. When I say in public, what I mean is outside the confines of a prison. After the passing of the Capital Punishment Amendment Act of 1868, all executions in Britain had to take place within the walls of county prisons. Before this, it was not uncommon for executions to take place anywhere. The first woman to be hanged within the walls of a country prison after the new legislation passed was Priscilla Biggerdyke. Yes, that was her name. Between this new act passing in 1868 and the last female hanging in 1955, a total of 41 women were sent to the gallows of various county prisons. So, who was the last woman to be hanged in Britain? The subject of this episode, that's who. Her name was Ruth Ellis. Born on October 9th, 1926 in Rill, a seaside town in northeast Wales, Ruth Ellis was one of six children born to her parents Arthur Nielsen and Elisabetta Guthels, known affectionately as Bertha. Arthur was a cellist from Manchester, northwest England, and Bertha was a refugee from Belgium in Western Europe. The couple married in 1920. Up to the age of 14, Ruth attended Fairfield's Senior Girls' School in Basingstoke, South East England. The reason she dropped out of school was to seek work as a waitress. Not long after Ruth dropped out of school, the whole family moved to London, England's capital, in 1941. A few years later, in 1944, a then 17-year-old Ruth met a Canadian soldier named Claire. To confirm, this was a male soldier. The couple wasted no time, and before long, they were expecting their first child. Ruth gave birth to a son whom she named Claire after his father. Baby Claire would later go on to be known as Andy Nielsen, as his middle name was Andrea. Andy's father soon returned to the Canadian Army, and although he initially sent money to Ruth for around a year after leaving to help support her and their son, the money then stopped. Ruth was unable to cope with life as a single mother, and Andy went to live with his grandparents instead. Now she had less responsibility, Ruth was able to pursue a new career. She decided to use her appearance to her advantage and started working as a nude model. It was as a result of this work that Ruth found a second job as a nightclub hostess. She was based at the Court Club on Duke Street in Mayfair, an affluent area in the West End of London. For some context, London's West End is the main commercial and entertainment centre of the city. The West End is to London what Midtown Manhattan is to New York City. The hostess job was well paid. Ruth earned significantly more than she had in her previous job as a waitress. Having said that, the manager of the court club, Maurice Conley, wouldn't be on a shortlist for World's Greatest Boss as he used to blackmail the hostesses into sleeping with him. At the start of 1950, 24-year-old Ruth generated a supplemental income by working as a sex worker. As if this job wasn't risky enough with regard to potentially catching a sexually transmitted infection, Ruth fell pregnant to one of her clients. The shocking part here isn't that Ruth terminated the pregnancy, 
although she did terminate it at around the three month mark, which is a long time to wait, and she did it illegally. It's the fact that she returned to her sex work as soon as the termination had been completed. On November 8th, 1950, Ruth got married. Her new husband was a frequenter of the court club and that was where they met. George Johnston Ellis was a 41-year-old dentist who had two sons from a previous marriage. Ruth became pregnant almost immediately and in 1951 she gave birth to a daughter named Georgina. George didn't even acknowledge Georgina's existence which is strange as she had the female equivalent of her dad's name. That reaction from George may seem out of the blue, however, he wasn't a nice man. For starters, he was an alcoholic, and a violent one at that. He was also extremely possessive over Ruth, and was prone to becoming insanely jealous at the most trivial of things. Just a note here that whilst Ruth was in her second trimester of pregnancy, she had an uncredited role as a beauty queen in the British comedy film Lady Godiva Rides Again. I've not heard of it either. It just seems so random for a pregnant woman with no acting experience to appear as an extra in a film. Anyway, back to the main story. Soon after the birth of Georgina, the couple separated and Ruth returned to her old line of nightclub work. In 1953, she became the manager of the Little Club. The Little Club was another London-based club in the district of Knightsbridge. It was very popular with the motor racing crowd. Think Sons of Anarchy style biker gangs, only with motor racing enthusiasts. It was at the Little Club where Ruth met her next partner, 25-year-old David Blakely. David was a former public schoolboy whom Ruth had met through British racing driver Mike Hawthorne. Mike Hawthorne, by the way, was the UK's first Formula One world champion driver in 1958, though soon after he retired due to the death of his teammate Peter Collins in the 1958 German Grand Prix. The talented driver died only three months after he retired in a road accident. David Blakely, on the other hand, was merely an amateur enthusiast and was in the process of building a racing car with his friend, Anthony Findlater. Like Ruth's ex-husband George, David was a big drinker and it wasn't long before he moved in with Ruth to her flat above the little club. As with George, Ruth suffered physical abuse at the hands of her new partner. And by the way, David was engaged to someone else when he moved into the flat, a woman named Mary Dawson. History would repeat itself as Ruth soon fell pregnant. If you're keeping score, this is Ruth's fourth pregnancy. Ruth wasn't really into the relationship as much as David was, however, so she opted for another termination. The couple soon separated and Ruth found herself a new partner, former RAF pilot Desmond Cusson. Desmond was a couple of years older than Ruth and had flown Avro Lancaster bombers during World War II. These heavy bomber planes became one of the most heavily used of the Second World War night bombers, delivering over 600,000 tonnes of bombs in 156,000 sorties. A sortie is an attack made by military personnel coming out from a position of defence. Ruth was eventually fired by the little club and moved in with Desmond. Despite this, Ruth started seeing David Blakely again on the side, with the pair becoming violent and resentful of each other due to them seeing other people at the same time as each other. The violence escalated to the point where a pregnant Ruth was punched in the stomach by David, causing her to miscarry. On April 10th, 1955, Ruth left Desmond's house, jumped in a taxi and had the driver take her to a flat in Hampstead, North London. Remember David Blakely's friend, Anthony Findlatter? The guy he was building a racing car with? This flat was where he and his wife Carol lived. The couple had recently hired a nanny whom Ruth suspected David was having an affair with. 
Ruth thought David was at the flat and she was right. But before she could get out of the taxi, David spotted her and quickly sped off in his car. Not one to be deterred, Ruth went to where she thought her alcoholic on-off boyfriend would be, the Magdala, a pub on South Park Hill in Hampstead. The pub was only around a quarter of a mile or 400 metres down the road from the Findlatter's flat. As she had expected, Ruth found David's car parked outside the Magdala pub. She sat on the side of the road near the car park and waited for David to emerge, which he did at around 9.30pm with his friend Clive Gunnell. Ruth quickly got up and hid in the doorway of Henshaw's, a newsagent located next to the Magdala. For reference, in the UK, a newsagent is a store which sells newspapers, magazines, tobacco, alcohol, snacks and drinks. I think it's comparable to a convenience store. Other names for such stores in the UK are Off Licence or Offy, as well as a corner shop. As the two men walked past, Ruth stepped out of the doorway and took them by surprise. Hello, David, was the line Ruth went for. Not the most creative or frustrated greetings. Upon being ignored, Ruth then simply shouted David's name, which he also ignored. They say hell hath no fury as a woman scorned. That proved to be the case that evening. Whilst David was attempting to find his car keys, Ruth removed a 38 calibre Smith & Wesson Victory model revolver from her handbag. Given there has been a ban on the private possession of handguns since the 1997 Firearms Amendments Act, I feel I can speak for most Brits when I say our gun knowledge is almost non-existent. So for a bit of background, the 38 calibre Smith & Wesson Victory model revolver was an updated wartime production version of the 38 calibre hand ejector military and police model of 1899. It was a revolver, by which I mean a repeating handgun that has a revolving cylinder containing multiple chambers each holding a single cartridge which was supplied to every branch of the American armed forces as well as British Commonwealth countries during World War II. The calibre of the gun is the internal diameter of the gun barrel bore, the hollow internal cavity of the barrel. This particular model was a 38 caliber, meaning the internal diameter was 0.38 inches or around 9 millimeters. For any gun enthusiast listening, I apologize if any of that information is incorrect. Please feel free to publicly correct me as I'll happily admit it if I'm wrong. I'm far from a gun enthusiast. Ruth aimed the gun at David and shot him a total of five times. Not being an expert marksman, Ruth's aim left a lot to be desired. The first shot missed David completely and he understandably tried to run away. Ruth gave chase and fired for a second time. This time her aim was true. David fell to the ground. Ruth walked over and stood over him before firing three more shots into him at point-blank range. It was later discovered that one of the bullets had been fired from a distance of less than an inch from David's back, as gunpowder burn marks were left on his skin. Even though the job was done and David was dead, Ruth attempted to fire the gun's sixth bullet into David, however the gun jammed. After multiple attempts, the gun finally fired into the ground, ricocheting off the road and into an innocent bystander. The bystander, a lady named Mrs Gladys Yule, luckily escaped with only a minor injury to her thumb. Upon hearing multiple gunshots, the pub started to empty as other drinkers came to investigate. Ruth turned to David's drinking buddy and said, Will you call the police, Clive? One such pub patron was off-duty policeman Alan Thompson, who arrested Ruth on the spot. Still holding the gun, she was noted as saying, I am guilty. I'm a little confused. Ruth was taken to Hampstead Police Station where she made a detailed confession and was subsequently charged with murder. 
David's body was taken to hospital with multiple bullet wounds to the intestines, liver, lung, aorta and trachea. For any non-medical experts, the aorta is the largest artery in the human body, running from the heart to the abdomen, while the trachea is another name for the windpipe, a tube that carries air to and from the lungs. On April 11, 1955, the day after the fatal shooting, a special hearing of Hampstead Magistrates Court was held. Following the hearing, Ruth was remanded in custody at Holloway Prison in the London district of Islington to await her trial. Within Holloway Prison, Ruth was segregated from the general population and placed in the hospital wing for observations. During a discussion with Dr Mervyn Williams, the chief medical officer at Holloway Prison, Ruth explained in great detail what had happened when she killed David. On May 3rd, 1955, Ruth underwent an electroencephalograph examination. An electroencephalograph is a test used to monitor the electric sensitivity of the brain. By using electrodes, the electrical activity of the brain is recorded and any present disorders will be detected. After having several electrodes fixed to her scalp, Ruth will have had to complete a series of simple activities for around 20 to 30 minutes, such as following a trail of light or the doctor's finger from side to side. It's considered a safe procedure. Ruth's test came back as normal or negative, meaning the electrical activity from her brain displayed a typical pattern. Therefore, it was concluded after several assessments that Ruth was perfectly sane. On June 4th, 1955, the defence team representing David sent a psychiatrist named Dr Whittaker to Holloway Prison to examine Ruth. This was followed up by a further examination five days later on June 9th, 1955 by Dr Dalzell, who was sent on behalf of the Home Office, a ministerial department of the Government of the UK. Both psychiatrists concluded that Ruth was sane. Having discussed how Ruth felt before David's murder, Dr Dalzell told the Home Office that he found no evidence of delusions, hallucinations or any other form of mental illness. You might see these multiple examinations by separate doctors as overkill, however it was legally required to ensure Ruth was of sound mind to be able to make a plea at her trial later in the year. The introduction of the Trial of Lunatics Act of 1883 came to be as a result of Queen Victoria frequently being attacked by an individual with mental health disorders. The act was such that if a jury found a defendant guilty, but the defendant was not of sane mind at the time of the crime, they would be kept in custody as a criminal lunatic rather than a prisoner. This type of verdict is known simply as guilty but insane. Of the 3,130 individuals who were charged with murder between 1900 and 1949, around 428 were considered to be insane. That equates to 13.6%. Ruth's trial started on June 20th, 1955. She was summoned to appear in the number one courtroom at the Central Criminal Court of England and Wales, commonly referred to as the Old Bailey, before Mr Justice Havers. To clarify, Justice wasn't Mr Havers' first name. Mr Justice is simply the name given to male judges of the High Court of Justice of England and Wales. Mr Justice Havers would translate to simply Judge Havers internationally. Ruth had made quite an effort with her appearance for the trial, something which her attorneys advised against. Dismissing their advice, Ruth turned up with freshly bleached blonde hair which stood out against her black two-piece suit and white silk blouse. The prosecution was led by Mr Christmas Humphreys. He asked Ruth the following question. When you fired the revolver at close range into the body of David Blakely, what did you intend to do? Ruth's reply pretty much sealed her fate. She said, It's obvious. When I shot him, I intended to kill him. 
no further questions were asked by the prosecution. In Ruth's defence testimony, she stated, quote, David only hit me with his fist or hands. I bruise easily. A few weeks or days previously, I do not know which, David got very violent. I do not know whether that caused the miscarriage or not. He thumped me in the tummy, unquote. Ruth mentioned the involvement of the Findlatters in what she saw as a conspiracy to keep David away from her. The defence team attempted to persuade the jury that Ruth was provoked, which could potentially lead to a verdict of manslaughter on the grounds of provocation rather than murder. However, Mr Justice Havers advised there was insufficient material, even upon a view of the evidence most favourable to the accused, to support this claim. The jury was then advised by the judge that they were not open to bring in a verdict of manslaughter on the grounds of provocation. Nothing further was said by the defence to the jury and they went away to consider their verdict. It only took the jury 23 minutes to return with a verdict of guilty. Following this verdict, Ruth was advised by Mr Justice Havers that he had no alternative but to sentence her to death by way of hanging. Ruth simply replied, Thank you. When an individual has been given a sentence of death, a petition for reprieve campaign takes place. A reprieve would result in the cancellation or postponement of the death sentence. Ruth explained to her mother that she did not wish for a reprieve, however her solicitor, acting upon the request of her relatives, wrote a seven-page letter to the Home Secretary, Major Gwilym Lloyd George, setting out the grounds for a reprieve. The Home Secretary is a senior Minister of the Crown within the UK government. Despite petitions containing several thousand signatures having been sent to the Home Office requesting a reprieve, the request was denied. On July 12, 1955, the day before Ruth's execution, she met with her newly hired solicitors Leon Simmons and Victor Mishcon to discuss her will. Her old solicitor was fired after writing to the Home Office. She specifically requested that she didn't want them to use what she was about to say to try and secure a reprieve, to which Victor Mishcon point-blank refused. Ruth proceeded to tell her solicitors the full story, including how she had been drinking with Desmond on the weekend of the shooting and that he had given her the gun. They were working on Ruth's aim by way of shooting practice. The two solicitors visited the Home Office as soon as Ruth had finished speaking to them. Home Secretary Major Gwilym Lloyd George said Ruth's statement made no difference to his decision to reject a reprieve. If anything, it provided greater evidence that the murder was premeditated. The Home Secretary stated, quote, Our law takes no account of the so-called crime passionel, and I am not prepared to differentiate between the sexes on the grounds that one sex is more susceptible to jealousy than the other. In the present circumstance, the woman was as unfaithful to her lover as he was to her. If a reprieve were to be granted in this case, I think that we should have seriously to consider whether capital punishment should be retained as a penalty." Unquote. Ruth was visited by her parents and brother later that afternoon. Her brother told reporters that Ruth seemed calm and unafraid of what was going to happen to her. Ruth then wrote a letter to David's parents, which read, I have always loved your son, and I shall die still loving him. Ruth had been weighed at 103 pounds fully clothed, just over 7 stone, which resulted in a drop of 8 feet 4 inches being set. The gallows had been tested the day before using a sandbag of the same weight as Ruth. The sandbag was left overnight on the rope to remove any stretch. At around 7am on the morning of the execution, the trap was reset and the rope coiled up to leave the leather-covered noose dangling at chest height above the trap. Ruth had requested that a cross be placed on the far wall of the execution room. After being visited by a priest on the morning of July 13th, 1955, Ruth was introduced to the hangman and his assistant at around 9am. 
They took her to the execution room, located next to Ruth's cell, where she was subsequently hanged. She was the 18th and final woman to be executed in Britain in the 20th century. At 9.18am, the execution notice was posted outside the prison gates. The 1,000-strong crowd who had gathered outside, which included many women with prams, then dispersed. Ruth's body was left to hang for the regulation hour and taken down at 10am. An autopsy followed, which confirmed that Ruth had died instantly. Her case is notorious due to the fact that she was hanged. It's thought that had she been handed a life sentence instead, her case would have simply been forgotten. Her body was buried in an unmarked grave at Holloway Prison, which was the custom at the time. Though Ruth's execution was generally supported by the British public, it helped strengthen support for the abolition of the death penalty. Ten years later, the death penalty was halted in practice for murder in Britain, with the last UK execution taking place in 1964. Ruth's body was exhumed in the 1970s and moved to St Mary's Church in Amersham, a market town in Buckinghamshire, South East England. Ruth's son, Andy, destroyed his mum's headstone shortly before he committed suicide in 1982. That was the story of British murderer Ruth Ellis. For more information on British murders, please subscribe to my channel, give me a like, hit me up on Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, Twitter and YouTube. All the links are in the description. You can join Patreon each month as a patron or you can contribute to the production of the show on a one-off basis with Buy Me A Coffee. The link for that is also in the show notes. Please feel free to send your case suggestions to me either via social media or via the email, which is britishmurderspodcast at gmail.com. Finally, as ever, if you can please continue leaving your reviews on iTunes, it would be greatly appreciated and it really helps the show grow. For now, I've been Stuart Blues. This has been British Murders. Thanks so much for listening. Until next time. Cheerio.